Hello and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. My name is Jamie. I'm from Encounter EDU and I'll be hosting this live lesson for you today. We're looking at how does CO2 affect the ocean and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Clara who is from Exeter University, an expert in ocean acidification and who's also a member of the Arctic Live team. Hello Clara, how are you? Good, thank I love you. The polar bear. Yeah, just hide it in the background. Uh, luckily, I think that's the closest we've got to a polar bear on Arctic Live. But yeah, thank, thankfully. <laughs> welcome to uh, Neolicent, to a virtual Neolicent. You can see the stunning Arctic scenery behind me. And just to let you know where Neolicent is, I have my mini globe here. So where are we? Bring this right into the camera. Oh. And we've got a um, little bit of glare, but here we are. We are on Svalbard, and that's an island, and that is halfway uh, between the top of Norway and the North Pole here. We've got Greenland here. We've got Iceland, UK, Norway, and Europe with France, Spain, and North America, Canada over here. Now, Neolicent, uh is a, sort of a science community, a science village. It is uh, the northernmost permanent community in the world at 79 degrees north. It used to be a mining settlement and over the past 50 years or so has turned into a base for Arctic research. So the stacks of other countries have stations up here. We're based at the UK's Arctic research station, but we have stations from Norway, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, China, India, and a host of other countries have researchers up in Neolicent. Now, when we're here, we're looking at a couple of things. We are looking at ocean acidification, which we'll be talking about today. And we'll also be looking at plastics. Uh, are there any microplastics in the fjord behind me? And that is the subject for Thursday's live lessons with Dr. Kerry Lewis from Exeter, looking at plastics in the Arctic. Now, the second thing we're doing is a whole series of live lessons for you guys too. We're in week two, we're in the science week, and it's great to be talking about ocean acidification. For this live lesson, we have a few segments. First of all, we are going to do some, some background to what ocean acidification is. We're then going to look at two investigations and then afterwards is a chance to do some Q&A about all your questions. And that's both the pre-submitted questions and those on the live chat. Now, if you are using the live chat next to the video here, remember YouTube is a social media platform. So please, if you're under 13, make sure that a parent, guardian or teacher is logged in with their account and they are posting things for you. We'd love to get your comments, your shout outs, your questions, but please remember it is a live classroom and to keep your messages on topic. So let's see who we have joining us. We have schools from uh, the United Kingdom, um, India, Spain, Brazil, Guernsey, and the USA. So hello to everybody joining. And just to check in to see the shout outs that we have. So hi to all the students from Oakfield Academy. Um, hello to all you guys. Um, hello to everyone from grade 11 biology students at PASB International School in Salvador, Brazil. Brilliant to have you all joining. And they are saying thank you for all the wonderful research and hard work you are carrying out to better our understanding of our environment and how to look after it. Well, fab you're on this journey with us too. Um, we have, to my budding scientists, uh, Sakaria, Yaya, Issa, and Mariam, keep up the fabulous work, and a big thank you to all involved in those sessions. So thank you so much, Ellie, who's often behind the camera, and to Clara and all the other scientists. Um, thank you for helping to put these on. Um, hi to Garden House School, and that's uh, from Josie and Jasper. Hi, guys. Lovely to have you with us. Um, a hello to Year 10 Geography students from King's College, uh, Murcia in Southeast Spain. Uh, great to have you on board. 
and a big hello to all students at St. Richard's Catholic College and wonderful to have you with us. So as I mentioned, uh, starting off, we're going to talk about this thing called ocean acidification. And Clara, if I can start off by asking you, what, what is it? How would you explain ocean acidification to someone who's, who's about 11? Okay, so the atmospheric CO2, so the carbon dioxide that is in our air, is increasing at a large rate at the moment, especially since the Industrial Revolution. Now, the oceans are really good sinks for carbon, and they actually absorb up to 30% of this carbon dioxide, um, which is a pretty large amount since, since the Industrial Revolution. Now, this carbon dioxide absorbs into the oceans and creates a substance called carbonic acid, which, given the name, is acidic. Now, this changes the chemistry of the ocean, so how, it, how it's made up, and is reducing the pH of the oceans, and they are becoming more acidic, which obviously changes the environment that organisms living in the oceans are exposed to. Okay. Amazing. And you use some fantastic terms. There are some great science terms we've got, one of which is, is pH, and the second one is acid. What, what do those words mean? So pH is the measurement uh, to show how acidic or how alkaline a substance is. And it's the measure of hydrogen ions. So I think Ellie has on screen at some point a scale which shows you uh, from the top uh, naught and number one, which is the most acidic, down to 14, which is the most alkaline solutions. Um, so, yeah, that's the scale, and it's done on a logarithmic scale. So even what seems like a small change in pH is actually a large change in hydrogen ions. Amazing. And we've, we've taken for the scale, like a lot of the scales that, that uh, scientists have started to use, we've taken the behaviour of pure water as, as a sort of midpoint. So So we've got... Um, pure water as as pH seven, and then either side of that, um, it's a sort of artificial middle, and then sort of on the other side you have fizzy drinks at about pH five five and a half, lemon juice at about two two and a half, all the way down to sort of battery acid, and then on the other way you've got soap at about nine nine and a half, all the way to drain cleaner as a <laughs> pretty toxic stuff at uh, pH fourteen. Um, so does that mean if we've got water at pH 7, does that mean that the ocean behind me here is, is pH 7 too? No. So um, the ocean pH currently is actually 8.1 in the open ocean. Um, and what we mean by ocean acidification is actually that number is dropping, so it is becoming more acidic. Um, for example, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, so the end of the 1700s, start of the 1800s, the pH of the ocean actually was 8.2. And in a pretty short amount of time, it's already dropped to 8.1, which, as I said before, may not seem like a large decrease, but actually it represents a 30% increase in hydrogen ions, um, which obviously is, is a fairly large amount. So the changes, although you can't see them at the moment, are, are happen, hap, happening very rapidly. And Clara, just before we get on to our investigations, I just picked up on this idea of a rapid change in, in pH levels. Are we expecting that rate to increase or stay about the same as we, as we travel through the 21st century? Unfortunately, based on current emission rates, we're expecting it to keep um, the pH to keep decreasing, so ocean acidification to accelerate. Um, and actually, by the end of this century, um, it's predicted to drop by another 0.3 or 0.4 units um, down to just above 7.7, 7, um, which in terms of hydrogen ions is a 150% increase. So, yeah, at the moment, we are unfortunately on track for a, lot, a rather large change in, in the oceans. 
Clara, it all sounds quite alarming, but just so we understand the process, um, we've we've got an investigation to do. Um, I think you've got a, a, a cup of water, as as do do I. Really? Um, I've got a, I've, uh, my 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 water's gone purple, and uh, my water's purple um, because um, I have put into it a pH indicator. Now, a, a pH indicator to, for those watching is something that shows you what the pH of a substance is. And at school, you may use litmus paper, uh, or in, 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 as a practicing scientist, you might use a, an electronic pH meter. Um, at home, I'm using a natural pH indicator. So a range of different uh, natural dyes will change depending on their pH. And if you search, for instance, on on, online for red cabbage pH indicator or blueberry pH indicator. There's a whole range of different ones. Um, you can choose to make your own at home. I've chosen blueberry for today. Um, the rest have gone in some muffins. And uh, the red cabbage is a bit stinky. So so although it's a great one, uh, maybe stay away from that um, unless it's a beautiful day. You can have all the doors and windows open. So, in fact, I've got two um, mini oceans here. Uh, because I want to see how it changes over time, whether we can change the colour. And, and Clara, what, what are we going to do um, to try and change the pH of our ocean? So we're going to represent uh, what the atmosphere would represent. So we need to increase the CO2 in our, in our water, just like the CO2 is in the oceans. So we're going to do that by blowing through our straw um, in, into the water as that will put some, some, well, hopefully put some carbon dioxide into our waters. Brilliant. Um, and Ellie, who you can't hear, but we can hear, um, is going to count us in uh, for two for two minutes. A quick, a quick tip, hit, hints and tips. Um, make sure your container isn't too full, uh, so it doesn't splash everywhere, and don't blow too hard, especially if you're near a computer. Uh, so. Um, I think we're going to be hearing a count counting soon. Are you ready, Clara? For two, two minutes of, of, of CO2 ness. Three, okay. two, one, go. So, this is a process by which more carbon dioxide. From the atmosphere is going into the ocean. So the more we drive, the more we fly, the more we use electricity from fossil fuels, the more of this is happening in the ocean. That's one minute. So at half time, just reflecting. What we're doing. the chemistry thirty seconds of our seas. And remember, Clara, you could, you are allowed to breathe. <laughs> And how was that for you, Clara? Um, I think I forgot to breathe at some point again. <laughs> breathe at some point. <laughs> so, if I just pick up um, my control, you can see 
Here we are. A uh, nice purple color. If I pick up what I've been putting carbon dioxide through, if I put them together, can you see? I've got a bit more of a pinky, pinky hue there. So if I kept on putting carbon dioxide through this one, I'd expect to get pinker and pinker and then probably clearer. And it's just peeking, peeking through these like this. And so what we can see is that after just two minutes of putting more carbon dioxide, we can see a discernible change in the pH of our mini ocean. Clara. 8.2, 8.1. Does it does it really matter to the life in our seas? Yeah, it most it most definitely does. Um, probably the best place to start is is the animals that build their skeletons or their shells out, out of calcium carbonate, so carbonates mm -hmm. mineral, and um, these organisms are actually ex experiencing. Um, quite a lot of vulnerability as they're less able to build their skeletons and shells as effectively as before, um, leading to them being more prone to breaking and becoming more fragile, which obviously has a big impact on them because it can cause them to die. Uh, but it's also really energetic. Um, so it uses a lot of energy to create these shells in such tough conditions um, which can take away energy for just simple things such as growth um, and reproduction, which again will have a knock on, on effect further. Okay, brilliant. So I've got some, I'm just going to bend down and grab some um, acid because I have a, a, a big, big tub of acid beside, my, beside me um, in the Arctic. Here we go. Um, it's not really, a, it is an acid. It is not the kind of acid that you would expect to get in the science lab. It is just this vinegar. And so I'm going to pour that into a mini ocean. There we go. That's going to, that's um, definitely, whew, it's a bit whiffy. Uh, and then I've got some chalk, Clara. What might happen if we put the chalk into the acid? Um, so this chalk's actually made from the same mineral. Um, so as we can see from organisms, their shells are, um, are becoming more fragile. We would probably expect that the, the chalk would undergo some sort of reaction with the acid. I'm going to try and hold that up. So I've got mega, mega bubbles going on here. So is this what's happening to to animals made out of chalk in the ocean? Is that things like um, shellfish? Are they just bubbling away under underneath the waves at the moment? Well, it's not quite as pronounced as, as this. Um, we ca we you can't actually see it um, in terms of like this. Uh, but definitely under microscopes and and stuff, you can see. Uh, the shells do have little pits in them, so like little holes, and the actual structure is not as um, uniformed as, as before. So if, if I'm getting, getting all this right, through industrial activity, we're putting much more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. About a third of all the carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere is actually then being absorbed into the oceans. This has made the ocean 30% more acidic over the past sort of 250 years. And over the next 80 years, likely to make it 150% more acidic again. And these changes really harm all these creatures that use calcium carbonate for their shells or structures. So we've got oysters we've got coral we've got we've got uh crabs yep uh tiny wee ones so uh pteropods some of my favorites this there's a sea angel all these types of creatures are being affected and we don't really hear much about this in the news what what's is this is this a science community thing what what's going on with the fact that this seems to me fairly dire 
And yet, for a lot of people, ocean acidification is something that's not quite on on their radar. Yeah, I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure why it's not um, as as out there as other things such as global warming. Um, but it's it's definitely something that people should know about and scientists should keep looking at because, as you said, some some of the results are pretty dire. Um, not not all of them. It, it is very um, species specific. So um, even the same sort of uh, so even if we take crabs, some some um, species of crabs can respond fine. Some can't at all. So there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, but as as there is in in other things as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something I'd encourage you to to look into and and read up about because um, it does matter, and also it is it is pretty interesting um, just to understand how these animals are coping and what they're trying to do. So, so when we've been up on on Arctic Live, I, I've seen you dodge beluga whales um, with a whole bunch of of different types of experiments up 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 in the arctic what what kind of things might we be looking for and and maybe first off why is the arctic an important place to study ocean acidification why do we come all the way up north to do this so um the carbon dioxide actually absorbs more in cold water than it does in warm water so at the poles like the arctic Um, ocean acidification is actually happening twice as fast as other parts of the planet. Um, So this gives us a really good opportunity to to go to places where they're experiencing it more and to try and understand how that might then affect um, the rest of the planet when it reaches that stage. Um, So that's why we've chosen the poles. Um, And what was your second question? (laughs) It's, it's, it's looking looking at the Brillo pads that we've been attaching to 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 the bottom of the ocean. Yes, so we've put out um, some um, attachments to the pier, which is um, just off the yeah just off the shore to our research station, and we are aiming to look at what settles in in which part of. Um, the ocean so just from the top down to the bottom it's not hugely deep um as it's still close to the shore and uh just seeing how that can change over the few years that we've that we've been up there um so yeah so it's looking at at, are are some of the small animals that maybe settle on onto surfaces that live in the ocean how those how their behavior might change as the chemistry of the water changes Exactly. And alongside this, we've also been taking water samples as well. So we can actually directly measure um, over the years. So we've been doing it for the last two years as well um, to see if if this is changing as, as well um, at various different points in the fjord and just to the mouth of the fjord by the open ocean as well. Amazing. So, and and it's fantastic to know that you've you've gone up to the Arctic, you've dodged beluga whales, you've got cold hands, you've 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 avoided frostbite, and and because it can be this this early warning system um, for for the rest of the planet, um, it's it's amazing work, Clara. Yeah, it's definitely one of the well the coolest place I've done scientific work. So, yeah, it's not a bad place to go. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm just going to come on on to a couple of questions um, that we've got coming through. We've got from uh, Oakfield Academy. Um, it's, it's how long would it take uh, for the reduction in CO2 levels due to the current pandemic to be apparent in the ocean? Or, or is this going to make a difference, what we're seeing at the moment um, in terms of the reduction of CO2 levels? So there's definitely been a reduction in CO2 levels um, during this COVID crisis. Um, and this year we'll probably see overall quite a, quite a big decrease from the, full, from the previous years. However, in terms of will this um, suddenly increase the pH back up to 8.2, unfortunately not just from these few months. However, um, A lot of things are now starting to change in terms of people being more encouraged to 
cycle to work or to walk to work as opposed to driving or getting the train. Um, and I think people are becoming just more aware of um, the environment. And if actually we can use this and take a positive out of this for change, um, then and bring down that or keep down those carbon emissions, then absolutely it can it can have a big difference in years to come. Amazing. And it's a great, great um, sort of lesson that we can take out of, of the current situation. But Clara, I've got another interesting question that's come through from SDG Warriors in India. Um, and, and they 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 are worry, uh, wondering, sorry, about some of the natural processes that might be able to, um, you know, help against uh, ocean acidification. They they identify that uh, aqu aquatic and marine plants and algae need carbon dioxide to photosynthesize. If we get more algae and more uh, aquatic plants growing, will that help to to reduce the impact of uh, human emissions that are then dissolved in the oceans? Yeah, there, ha there have been some studies into that, um, especially um, adding iron to the seawater, which can boost this algal growth. Um, however, I haven't seen anything that uh, will make this like a big, a big project at the moment. Um, so for me, I think it's more important that we s actually stop the emissions rather than um, try and solve something after the emissions because that that is the thing that will make the biggest difference and and i mean that's a very good point is is a prevention better than sort of cure is, is is the scale of change simply too much for from what you've seen for these types of um projects like a boosting aquatic plant growth um to cope with are we just putting too much into the ocean um yeah i think potentially um I think we have to remember that the ocean is vast um, and is absorbing CO2 all the time. Uh, so potentially to create something on a large enough scale would be really, really hard. Um, so, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest barriers to something like that. And, and we've got a question for, oh, on the live chat. Great um, interaction on the live chat. Keep them coming. Um, Lana uh, Neves is... I was asking, is it possible to reverse ocean acidification? Um, how, 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 how can we can we can we just sort of reduce the the speed of increase, or can we actually put it put it into reverse? Um, we can definitely reduce the speed of it, uh, as we as we spoke about before, and um, yeah, the it's the main problem is the scale of of how quickly it's it's all happening. Um, so it's happening quicker than uh, cha any changes seen in the last 300 million years, which obviously is a very, very long time. Um, so if we can halt even a little bit, then that's going to help help quite a lot because the, it's the scale of how quickly everything is happening is, is what's making it so extreme. And um, like we've kind of touched on a little bit, anything that we can do to reduce our carbon footprint uh, will will go a long way towards reducing, obviously, the overall carbon emissions. Um, and I think it's really important that people feel that they they are able to make a difference. Um, because if if everyone started just cutting their carbon footprint even a little bit, and millions and millions of people are doing that, then that can have a big impact overall. I mean, Clara, that leads brilliantly into a question from Dragon uh, uh, Mellow Thirteen, a uh, YouTube username, um, and, and asking sort of what are the what are the possible ways that we could reduce carbon dioxide um, in in the air in, in in the seas. That's a really good question. Um, so we've touched a little bit on travel. Um, we can all probably cut down the or change the way we travel. Um, so potentially trying to fly less, which obviously is happening at the moment. Um, and like we said, walking to work or cycling to work or using public transport when it's safe to do so a little bit more. Uh, but also we can change our diet, um, which I think is something that's quite a big at, 
at the moment quite a big change into becoming more plant-based so a lot of people becoming vegetarian or vegan or even like we spoke about earlier having just a meat-free Monday is well that's cutting out potentially two or three meals worth of meat which is a really really good place to start brilliant Clara thank you I mean we've got a question coming through um which is 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 so looking at, at the, the sort of ecosystem as a whole and asking, are, are land species also affected by ocean acidification? Um, so the, the land species aren't actually living in the ocean. Um, so they won't be exposed to, to that as a, as a thing. But um, I actually don't know if rising carbon dioxide affects land animals um but not in the right. it won't be in the same way would there be indirect impacts and i'm thinking here about polar bears um and other of those sort of more sort of marginal um sort of land land species that sort of maybe have a relationship to the sea yeah definitely so um a lot of the animals that have these carbonate structures um are at the bottom of the food web or near the bottom of the food web um, so obviously, if anything impacts them um, and they become smaller or they don't reproduce as much, then this will have a knock on effect to animals further up the um, food web, which obviously then when you come to your polar bear, if it's got less less food available, it will have an impact on that. And also actually on humans as well, because a lot of humans rely on the sea for their their food. I mean, I know that on that last point, there's been a huge amount of work going on with um, the American government on the oyster fisheries on the um, Pacific Coast, North Pacific Coast in Washington State. That's been a, a, a big, big area of concern from a commercial point of view um, with ocean acidification. So, it, it as you as you point out, it is a, it is you know, as a land species, we we, we are affected. Um, we've got a question through um, from Samira, um, and, and, and it's again looking at these technical solutions to um, carbon dioxide. And this one is, is looking at the genetic modification of aquatic algae or, or plants to absorb more CO2, um, as well as um, gen genetic modification of animals to make them um, better uh, suited to to future changes uh, in ocean chemistry and this ocean acidity. Yeah, I I don't know a massive amount about the actual genetic modification, um, so I couldn't hugely comment on that. But um, I would assume that the reason that this is important is because, as we mentioned before, it's happening so rapidly. These changes that actually um, animals on their own aren't able to adapt they don't have enough time to genetically change themselves to be able to to cope better um so and and so that that clara that that's brought up a couple of things for me is is this um rate of environmental change versus the rate of um evolution um and adaptation to cope with these changes how come have we these sort of two rates seem to be out of sync so the rate of environmental change seems to be as you you mentioned sort of so fast that this rate of of adaptation can't keep up with that it, it, is that something we can put numbers to um it it's quite species specific again because um obviously some organisms can um, have rapid generation turnover whereas others take a long time um, to, to reach reproduction and then to, to um, actually reproduce um, but also it, it de depends to a certain extent of where these organisms actually live so if we took like a coastal environment or uh, an estuary environment a lot of organisms in these environments are already exposed to quite a large change in pH naturally um, due to things like upwellings and um, impacts from the land anyway. And obviously estuaries have the freshwater input as well. 
Um, so actually, they can already be exposed to a 0.5 up to a whole unit change in pH over a season down to even to a day. Um, so potentially these organisms actually are slightly more adapted and will be able to cope better um, with the added addition of ocean acidification, whereas animals that live in the open ocean tend to have quite a steady pH. So any changes there, uh, potentially they, they won't be able to adapt quite as well. Clara, thank you for, for pointing out that when we're dealing, especially it seems with biology, is that with living creatures, we can't just put a sort of X equals Y, plus whatever it is, that these are living creatures who behave differently in different environments. Absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got um, um, just a, a reminder for, for um, P. Whitaker on, on YouTube. Is, is about the Arctic being the best place to do science on ocean acidification. I think you covered that really well before, talking about the fact that ocean acidification is happening twice as fast in the Arctic because of the temperature of the surface waters here taking up more carbon dioxide. And so we, it almost forms a sort of early warning system. Um, this is um, from uh, username K.O. Barroso. Um, and we're really looking at sort of, and I know this is probably outside both of our sort of areas of expertise, but looking, I think, at um, future tech advances contributing to the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions, um, creating a, a, a type of engineering um, that absorbs carbon dioxide from the from the oceans, whether that's some type form of, of, of carbon capture storage, but. Um, are, the, are these things that you're familiar with or would you sort of warn people towards sort of like, well, maybe that reduction is, is the best strategy? Yeah, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with, with stuff like this. I know carbon capture is, is something that is, is being looked into and experiments are being done. However, I tend to agree with you. I think actually a reduction in the first place um, is well, that would be my preference anyway, and I think that's that's the way we should be going. And and and, and really, that that that's because I mean we have had there is a natural sort of natural system of coping with carbon dioxide going to the ocean. There's something called buffering, and this has happened for for sort of hundreds millions of years. Um, so so there are natural systems, and and are, are you saying that if we reduce our impact? On natural systems, it will be best we're able to sort of to restore some some form of balance. Yeah, definitely. So the the ocean has a lot of ions in it, which, as you mentioned, form this natural buffering system. Um, and but these come from things like the weathering of rocks, which is not a rapid process. It takes time. Um, and as we mentioned. O currently ocean acidification is a really rapid process. So if we can slow that down, it obviously then gives um, the oceans more time to, to yeah, generate this, this buffering system and um, go back more back into sync as it was before. And there's, there's a really interesting question coming in here from um, that some, some, some stories or some ways of understanding ocean acidification might be a sort of slow decrease of all species that they're all going to start to, you know, like like our like our chalk in our glass of vinegar, that everything's going to gently sort of dissolve away. But there will probably be winners and losers, like a lot of types of environmental change. Is that something you can sort of describe in a, in, in a bit more detail? That's responding to a comment by of Dragon Mallow 13. Yeah, definitely. So we've touched on it quite a lot that a lot uh, a lot of processes are species specific. Um, so quite a lot of of it depends on actually the animal's ability to acid base regulate. And what I mean by that is to regulate the internal pH, so the pH that is surrounding and in its cells where all all its processes happen. So the better able organisms are to regulate this and keep it at a stable pH that it's used to, um, potentially the better that they will be able to survive um, ocean acidification. And this has been very species specific again. Um, so it's quite hard to say uh, 
this will be a winner, this will be a loser, because actually, just like humans, every animal is different. Um, so it does make it hard from that sort of thing. Uh, but that's that's why more research and continual research is, is definitely needed. Um, yeah, to just to see to see how different animals respond. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. And and it's, there's a lovely question just just pop, pop, popped up on the on the live chat. Is we're not able of um, for obvious reasons able to to be up in the Arctic um, right now where we would be at the moment. Clara, what do you miss most about the Arctic? Well, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. Um, I think just just being there. I know that sounds a bit weird and a fluffy answer, but it's really hard um, for pictures to do it justice. And, and it's actually really hard to explain how it feels when you like walk off that little plane um, and everything's just so pristine and fresh. And uh, yeah, it's just an amazing place. So I'm definitely, definitely missing that. And obviously being able to do, do the science because um, that's obviously what I enjoy and what, what we go up for. So, yeah, and Nick, obviously, who's Nick, our station Nick, manager. <laughs> manager. If, if, if uh, oh, one of our most experienced uh, polar field experts and polar travellers in, in the UK and gave two wonderful interviews last week, and they are available to view on Catch Up on the Encounter EDU YouTube channel. But, Clara, um, I know it's difficult to put into words but could you describe uh, Neil Olsen and, and the sort of scenery behind me to someone who 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 has never been to the Arctic? Yeah, so it's a it's a quite a small little research base, and there's little wooden huts dotted over um, from different countries. So I think we have what China, Italy, Norway. There's a lot, isn't? It? I don't know how many there is altogether, but. 11 um i knew you'd know um and and then there's obviously like the main place where we all eat together which is really cool because you can you can chat to different people um and then there's a marine station uh where we can obviously do some of our work and the boat which is for our work super important um and how yeah feel, how does it feel how's it feel um Oh, I don't really know how to describe it. It just feels great. Um, I think you realise uh, like how important it is to be safe because you do feel a little vulnerable um, and you definitely feel isolated. Um, so obviously safety is really important because the nearest hospital is ages away. Um, and I guess you kind of feel quite lucky because you're very aware that it is quite hard to get to and not many people get that opportunity. So, um, yeah, I guess it spurs us on a bit more to make sure we get the best data we possibly can. Brilliant. Clara, thank you for so much. I think we've, we're running out of time for questions. We've got some great comments coming through here. And there's one more which we're going to bring in. Um, we've got some on, um, again, on the te technical front, uh, and just just for those watching, uh, is is it's is amazing to think that the science community, every single scientist, knows about everything. Um, but unfortunately, we do, we don't have experts on some of the the technology, technological um, or proposed technological solutions um, to carbon, such as those being proposed in the live chat. Um, very very sorry. We can talk a lot about the. Uh, research on onto ocean acidification, the processes, the impact on especially to marine invertebrates, and even interactions uh, with other types of pollutants and, and how that might affect uh, marine invertebrates. I'm very sorry that we can't address some of those. But what I am going to take um, from here is, um, you know, we, we, we've thought about, um, you know, ocean acidification as, as almost or the absorption of carbon from the atmosphere as being a good thing because it reduces um global warming by reducing the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is is is, is that still the case can can the ocean provide you know is it is it a bit of a help um well yeah it will keep absorbing uh carbon dioxide 
but which may be a help in in some terms but actually uh to the organisms living in it 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 can have can have some nasty effects on them so um yeah not i'd say let's try and reduce the those emissions as much as we can Brilliant. Clara, thank you so much. And for, for pointing out the complexity of our Earth system, we can't uh, just feel because the ocean is, is taking on board some of our problems that it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So thank you for, for sort of making these invisible changes visible. And definitely some of the changes that are visible, if you look, on, as you pointed out, look under the microscope at, at some of these, these poor sea creatures. Um, thank you so much uh, for being part of Axe Arctic Live today. Thank you all those who are watching. We are back tomorrow looking at the science of a changing Arctic, and that is with Dr. Kerry Lewis. And we'll be looking overall about the types of research that take place in the Arctic and some of the topics um, we are looking at. So without further ado, it's to me to thank uh, Clara, thank you so much for being part of Arctic Live. Look forward to being up in the Arctic again with you in the future. But for now, it's bye-bye to all those watching. Bye-bye.